turn your Bibles into the book, the Old Testament book of Haggai. Haggai, the book of Haggai. And uh, that's one of the shortest book in the Old Testament. Um, I see many of us turning to the first page in the Bible because it's in the middle of the Old Testament. Uh, it's one of the minor prophets there, and if you're, we'll take some extra time to look for that. I know it's not really a message or uh, many preachers preach from, but I believe that this will be a tremendous help. And it's a very practical message that will be help to us. Uh, the book of Haggai is within the last couple books within the Old Testament. You go to Malachi, you went too far. Uh, it's between the two Z books, the two Z books, Zephaniah and Zechariah. So if you're able to turn there, Haggai chapter 1, we'll read verses 1 through 8. It's one of the minor prophets here. Minor doesn't mean that it's of less significance. It just means it's an extremely short book. And if you see it, it's a very short book here, uh, but a very practical instruction for uh, the people here that we can also apply within our lives. The book of Haggai in verse 1, chapter 1, it says here, and reads here, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek. The high priest saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, it is, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into the bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that you just be with us today as we look into the right priorities within our life. And Lord, as we see the instruction given by the prophet Haggai to the people of God, to your people, Lord, in the Old Testament, I pray that the principles here regarding not the rebuilding of the temple, but we can apply within our life, the importance of having the right priorities, to the importance of putting you first within our life. And Lord, I pray that you just be with this message. Allow us to hear from your word only. Put aside opinions. Put aside personal discretions. Anyways, Lord, and I pray that your name would be magnified above all else. That this message would help us to glorify you and to please you. We thank you once again for this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we see here in the book of Haggai, we see the importance really of continuing in the right priorities. And obviously the people that were written to, the audience that with this book, the prophet was writing to is the people of God. But really the principles here could be applied within our life today as well. I think about priorities within our culture today in the United States. The Wall Street Journal in 2016 posted this on their website before about the average working American from Monday through Friday. You see, the average uh, working American, you see here on this chart, uh, the biggest one would be personal care. They spend 8.86 hours whether it comes to personal care, whether that's brushing your teeth, majority of it probably is sleeping, that's personal care. And then after that, you see working, 8.13 hours, and then you see TV and leisure activities, sports, hobbies, 3.28 hours. You see eating, 1.08 hours. I don't think that's accurate, but maybe that is, you know, in many ways, uh, 1.08 hours. Shopping is 0.55 hours. That may be different for some. And caring for somebody is 0.10 hours. That's pretty sad. Caring for families is 0.46 hours. Education is 0.08 hours. It's the lowest here. Household activities is 1.10 hours. That could be involving cleaning, which may be zero for some, you know, uh, and many more for others. And then we see phone or emails, 0.08 hours. Now, I don't know how accurate that is as well. And miscellaneous is 0.14 hours. And then religious activities is 0.14 hours, which means that religious activities at most 
on this survey, you can't even see it on this pie chart here, but that it is one of the lowest, the second lowest, or third lowest here, uh, uh, 0.14 hours, about 13 to 14 minutes, the average working American spends on some form of religious activity. Now, all of this that's listed on this chart, they're not bad. It's not bad to sleep, amen? It's not bad to eat. It's not, none of these things are bad. But the problem is, and the reason I truly believe that we have such a decline within our culture when it comes to our Christian faith is because the priorities that the average American has is no longer unto God, but more on self. Yet the time spent even on television or leisure activities is 3.14 hours more than the time spent on religious activities. It shows where many Americans who work a full schedule place their priorities. Once again, none of these are wrong. None of these are bad. But it shows us and it shows within our life that there is certainly more emphasis placed in many people's lives on external factors rather than the spiritual factor, which is our relationship and prioritizing our faith within our God. And the question is that, are we having the right priorities in how much we spend our time? And here in the book of Haggai, we find a similar situation of wrong priorities placed in time. You see, the book of Haggai was written about 520 BC, and remember that date because it's slightly going to be important here, but by this point of time, it was under the reign of Cyrus then to Darius. Haggai chapter 1, it says here, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Now, I want us to understand what's going on here, and specifically, he's, Haggai is addressing the problem uh, that the people were, the Jews were having of, about a temple, God's temple being built. Now, before I talk about that, remember this was written in about 520 BC. Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the south and the northern kingdom. One was Judah, one was Israel. Many of the kings in Israel were obviously bad. Many of the kings in Judah, some were good, some were bad. But the last two were definitely not good. The last two kings of Judah were not good. And we see here, whereas uh, the last two kings here in 2 Kings chapter 24, it says here, Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he begun to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was uh, Hamantol the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord according to that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he had cast him out of his presence and Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. So the last two kings here of Israel, of Judah, of Judah specific, I apologize about that, Judah here is Zedekiah and Jehoiakim. Both of them were not good kings. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. And they even rebelled against the king of Babylon, who was Nebuchadnezzar at that time. You see Babylon here on this map. Babylon is where the modern day Iraq is, where Baghdad is the capital is today. Babylon was the capital of the Babylonian, the Neo-Babylonian Empire of that time. It's between the Tigris and the Euphrates Empire, which is modern day Iraq or Iraq. And so you see Judah over here, where Israel, modern day Israel is today, and Syria, and so on. And you see here that you know, the two kings of Judah were obviously doing evil in the sight of God. And so Nebuchadnezzar sends his army from Babylon to conquer and to take over Judah and to take the people into captivity and to take them back into Babylon, into exile. So the Jews were taken from Judah all the way around from Syria. You have to go around the yellow on the bottom part there, like a hump there, and then go all the way to Babylon. And so you have about 50,000 to 60,000 Jews that were taken into captivity when the Babylonian Empire took over Judah and took over that part. All the yellow there is the Babylonian Empire that took over within that century. And so Nebuchadnezzar was the king there. He took the king Jehoiakim. He took the king uh, Zedekiah. He takes all of them. And all of them are under captivity. Now, if you know your ancient history, you know Babylon, Babylonia took over the Assyrians. And then the Babylonians, they get taken over by a tribe known or a group of people known as the Medes-Persians. The Medes-Persians. You see media there. That's not TV, okay? That's 
you know, media, that's a, you know, that's a name for an empire, the Achaemenid Empire, which is also known as the First Persian Empire. And so the First Persian Empire, about, you know, 539 BC, 539, uh, BC takes over Babylonian Empire. They get into a battle, they take over the entire, Cyrus the first takes over the entire Babylonian Empire, and now all of this yellow becomes part of Persian Empire, the first Persian Empire, the Medes Persian Empire at this time. And so when we come here in this context here, what's going on and uh, is that Cyrus, the first king here, gives a mandate that those that were in exile in Babylon, remember they were taken to captivity, those that were in exile in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, by the Babylonian empires, now they were to go back to Jerusalem. Now they were to go back to Jerusalem, and then there's a mandate to rebuild the temple that was destroyed, God's house that was originally destroyed. And in Ezra chapter 1, it says, Thus saith Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven had given me the kingdom of the earth, and he had changed me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is at Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is Judah, and build the house of God, a uh, house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. So the exiled Jews start to come back. Now, not all of them come back. Some do, some do not. But a majority of them do come back from exile. They're in Babylon. You know of three individuals that were in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. You know of that, Daniel and along them. And then they come back to Jerusalem, they come back here, and they're coming back, and then they're starting to rebuild the temple. We're rebuilding the house of God, and they're rebuilding this continuously. In Ezra chapter 3 and 4, we see them continuously build that, uh, the temple, for many years. But at some point, in Ezra chapter 4, we see here, Then sees the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, so it sees unto the second year, of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they have the mandate to come back. They have the uh, opportunity to come back to Jerusalem. They start rebuilding the temple. And then at some point, because of some issues, and you can read that later in your free time there in Ezra, some issues, whether it was the Samaritans, whether it was uh, other means, the government itself, they seized rebuilding the temple. So it was being built, but then they stopped it for some reason. They stopped it for several reasons, actually. Uh, interference from different means. They got distracted, essentially. They stopped, and they were no longer being able to uh, build this. And so now we come here in Haggai chapter 1, where they're supposed to be building this again. They're supposed to rebuild this completely. But then somewhere along the line, they just chose not to rebuild it. It seems that one point in Ezra chapter 4, and now they come to a point where they are no longer rebuilding this. And really, it's not because they are still under government mandate to stop rebuilding. It's really because they have the wrong priorities. They have the wrong priorities. And Haggai, through the, uh, the Lord speaking to his prophet Haggai, addresses this issue here. And he addresses the people here uh, when it comes to it. And the reason people did not build the house of the Lord is because they did not make it a number one priority. They did not make it a priority within their life. They did not see the task as important or as they were responsible to accomplish first. And the danger within our Christian life is that we too have a task. It's not to rebuild the temple, but it is to obey God. It is to follow what God has commanded us to do within Scripture. It is to follow the mandates that we find throughout the New Testament that God has given to each and every one of us. But the question is, are we prioritizing what God has commanded us to do first as much importance? Or are we busy with other responsibilities that we are not tasking ourselves to accomplish the main priority, which is to obey God and to love God? And I want us to notice here three, address, three uh, problematic areas that the Lord addresses through the prophet Haggai here. Three problematic areas that we are dealing with the Israelites' priorities that will help us as believers even today apply within our life. And to have and to continue in the right priorities. First of all, I want us to notice here the problematic area that God is addressing here. He's addressing their excuse. 
They're addressing their excuse. Haggai chapter 1 verse 2, it says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Remember once again that the temple, the rebuilding of the temple has ceased. They were done with it. They stopped this for a second. They got distracted. Maybe interference from uh, the Persian Empire stopped them from rebuilding this temple in many ways. And at some point, when you cease rebuilding, at some point you're supposed to go back and start rebuilding again. You need to start accomplishing what was originally commanded of them to do, to build this house of the Lord in Jerusalem. But then they got distracted. They made an excuse. Haggai, speaking on behalf of the Lord, says this. This people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And there came a point, they stopped, and they no longer would continue to rebuild the temple. They were intervened by an external factor, and the Lord addresses this excuse. This is their excuse. Lord, this is not the time. This is not the time that the Lord's house should be built. And within our lives, within, within our personal lives, within this time that we live in today, we received a command in our personal life. Not to rebuild a temple specifically, but we received many commands within the Word of God, which is to love God, which is to put God first within our lives. And the question is, are we doing that or are we making excuses? Lord, I don't have time. Lord, I don't have time to worship you. I don't have time. It's not the right time to go soul winning right now. It's not the right time to, uh, you know, be faithful to church. It's not the right time. And Lord, there's so many, you know, ways that it's just not the right time. People like making excuses. People like to blame others when it comes to their own fault. Even Adam and Eve. As a result of them being kicked out of the garden, you know, as we think about their original sin that they committed, we'll notice when it says Genesis chapter 3, and he said, Who told thee? God is saying, Who told thee that thou art naked? Has thou eaten of the tree? Wherefore I have commanded thee that thou should not eat. I commanded thee not to eat of the tree. Did you eat of this? And the man, Adam, said, The woman who thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Man's first decision is to blame woman. You know, that's what, you know, that's what they did. He blames her. And then they ask of the woman, and the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And from the beginning of time, blame was going somewhere else, when really the blame should have belonged to ourselves. And the people here that Haggai was addressing, they were blaming time. It's not God's, it's not the right time, Lord. We can't do this. It's not the right time to rebuild this. It's not the right time to resume this uh, construction of this temple. Yet the reality is they're blaming something that is not at fault. They're blaming time. The reality is they were simply disobedient. They were lazy. They did not prioritize what was important. They were supposed to rebuild this, but they did not prioritize what was important, and they started to make excuses. And God sometimes brings trials within our life to help us grow in suffering, but sometimes trials come to try to get our attention, to get our attention, to correct us in many ways. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 9, God said through Haggai to the people here, Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little. When he bought it a home, I did blow upon it. When he bought a home, I blew upon it. I, I, I obstructed it. I, I caused an issue for it. And he says, Why? Say the Lord of hosts. Because of mine house that is in waste, and ye run every man of his house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, the ground bringing forth, forth and men, upon the cattle. Basically upon everything I brought a drought. And God brought a trial to kind of get their attention. Look, what are you guys doing? And it's amazing how many times in the Old Testament that God brings a trial puts them under captivity to try to get them to uh, be attentive to what their sin is or maybe even their right priorities. And sometimes within our life, when God has commanded us to do, if we're not careful, we start to make excuses for them. And we got to make sure that we don't and we acknowledge that sometimes 
that we are simply not prioritizing the right thing. And, there's, and we need to admit that. We need to admit that sometimes within our life, and it gets busy, life gets busy, and life gets, you know, a lot of things get thrown at us, and certainly many external factors within our lives would cause us to be a little bit wavered a little bit. And sometimes that's from the devil, sometimes that's just life itself. Sometimes life itself throws upon us, uh, you know, a curveball that we are simply distracted. But then we must continuously not make excuse and try to prioritize what is important. And so Haggai, do, and the Lord speaks to Haggai addressing the people's excuse. But notice secondly here, he addresses their priorities. Not only he addresses their excuse, he addresses them, this is your excuse. This is why you're not rebuilding your temple because you're saying you don't have the time. Now he addresses their priorities. And and first of all, I want you to notice here, when it comes to their priorities, their priorities, they're wrong. Their priorities that were wrong. In verse 3 in Haggai chapter 1, it says, Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and the house that lie in waste? My house lie in waste. Haggai, speaking on behalf of the Lord, was addressing the excuse they made. You say you don't have time, but you're building yourself sealed homes. And what do you mean by sealed? It's from the uh, Hebrew word safan. And talking really about a house that has a cover, a panel. It's really a nice house that they're building for themselves. And they're building themselves a nice house. And he's really, God is speaking to Haggai saying, you say you don't have time to build a house, but you built yourself a house. You can't build my house. You can't build my house right now, but you yourself, you right now, you say, Lord, it's not the time. We can't build your house, God. And then, in the back, you're building your own house. And he's saying here, you can't use that as an excuse. You can't say that you don't have time, but you're building a house there. The same panels, the same materials that could have been used, the luxury that could have been used for my house, which you have been commanded to rebuild in Jerusalem, you're not doing it, not because of time, but because you have the wrong priorities. You have a home that has a cover, a panel, it's completed, yet you couldn't even finish my house. The people of God had the wrong priorities. They were working on their home rather than the house of God. They finished their home rather than the house of God. Sometimes the excuses that we make are not exactly the strongest arguments as well. A wealthy man, a wealthy man was standing in front of a casino when he was approached by a desperate looking man. A businessman was approached by a desperate looking man and says, Please! The man begged frantically. This poor looking desperate man was begging the businessman, Please help me. Could you possibly spare me $500? My wife is very sick. I really need the money to take her to the doctor and to buy her the medicine that she needs. And the wealthy businessman looked at him suspiciously and said, If I give you $500, how do I know that you won't go into the casino and just gamble it all away? And the man quickly responded, Oh no, sir, I would never do that. I have gambling money. Obviously, the wealthy man had the money, or the uh, desperate man had the money, but he had the wrong priorities. His priority should have been always to take care of his wife, but he had the wrong priorities with what he had had. And the people of God had the time, but they had the wrong priorities. They wanted to spend that time building their own luxurious and comfortable home, whereas they were commanded to build the house of God. And we have to be mindful within our life to make sure that we don't fall into that same trap. We don't have, we have to make, we have to make it a, a decision within our life to make sure that we have the right priorities. It's not that we don't have time, it's that we are not prioritizing what is truly important. And so within our Christian life, what God has commanded us to do, whether it's obeying the Word of God, whether it's following God, we must put that as our number one priority above all else, above something else, above perhaps other external factors within our life. I think about one of my college professors that always used to drill this in our head in our leadership class. He would say this, we have time for what is important for us. We have time for what is important for us. Is it wrong to spend time on other external factors? Is it wrong to spend time watching football? Is it wrong to watch Netflix? Is it wrong to spend time with friends for three hours? No, none of that is wrong. But the problem is, not time, 
but where our priorities are misplaced. If we're spending more time on something else when we should be spending it in the Word of God, in prayer, in seeking after God first, my friend, that our priorities are slightly misplaced. Even other excuses within our life could come. I want to love, but that's not within my personality. Oh, we all love something, but our love must be towards God and not to others. I want to be kind, but I just had a difficult week. I want to respect my wife, but you don't understand my wife. But God has commanded us. And our priorities is under God's priorities. What God has commanded us to do first, we must accomplish that. Above our own desires, above our intentions, above our priorities within our lives. And so Haggai was addressing their problems. Their priorities were wrong. But then he, he says here, their priorities were also a waste. Your priorities are wrong. You're supposed to build my temple. You're supposed to build my house. But you're building your own home. And notice what happens here when you're building your own home, when you prioritize the wrong things. He says here in verse 5, Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Now, keep in mind, consider your ways is putting your heart on the road. That's what that phrase kind of means, putting your heart on the road. Consider your ways. Now, remember that phrase, consider your ways, because it should be mentioned several times here in the first chapter. Consider your ways. Put your heart on the road. You have so much, but bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with the drink. Ye clothe you, but there is not none warm. And he that earned wages, earned wages to put in the bags with holes. And he's essentially saying here, all the things that you do right now are waste. You drink, but you're not filled. You eat, but you're, not, you're still hungry. You clothe, but none of them is warm within your life. And the Lord was really addressing to them, they're busy with their own home, they're busy with their own priorities, but guess what? All of that is a waste. None of that is going to satisfy you. None of that is going to bring you blessings. None of that is going to help you in any way in the long term. Jesus spoke about this concerning worry and anxiety. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not life more than a meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not better than they, which of you, taking by thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And Jesus was addressing worry about their physical body. The, pe the people here were, were worrying about their physical body here. And he was saying, you know, you're, you're worrying about eating. You're worrying about drinking. But then notice the birds here. They don't worry about that. They know God will feed them in some way. They know that they will be fed in some way. But aren't you as humans better than the birds in the air? Aren't you better than all of that? Why do you worry? Why do you worry? You, all of that will be provided. He says here at the end here, verse 27, by taking all of these worries, is that going to add one span? Is that going to add one day? Is that going to add one year unto your stature, your life? Is worrying about all of this, about your physical needs, going to add anything to your body? No. He says no. Life is more than just the food that you eat or what you drink. Does worrying help you in any way? No. You know, we all have different views of what waste is, what time waste it is. Charles Francis Adams, which is the son of President John Quincy Adams and the grandson of President John Adams, kept a diary. One day, he entered into uh, the diary. President John Quincy Adams added to the diary. He wrote this, Went fishing with my son, Charles, a day wasted. His son would eventually keep a diary as well, which is still in existence. And on that same day, he made an entry into his book. He wrote, went fishing with my dad, the most wonderful day of my life. And the father, he to the father, he thought he was wasting time fishing with his son, but his son, son saw it as an investment of time. And what we think is an investment Right now, in this world, what we think is important to God is of, not, of no importance. We want to 
factor in and, and you know we all there's nothing wrong with it again and you know we have stocks we have investments and all these different things and uh, we worry about certain things in, in our life right now and certainly there ought to be a balance between our things but to God all of that all of the materials in this world are nothing they're not important they're just dust to him they're just gonna collect mom they're, they're nothing what is important is eternal life. And that's why Jesus, at the latter portion of that verse, he says, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. He's saying, don't seek after these things about your physical needs. Seek the kingdom of God first. And every time, even throughout the parables, even in the New Testament, Jesus always says, be ready. He says, watch and be ready. Don't worry about what's going on in this world. All the crazy things happening, don't worry. Are we going to survive the next day? Or is this world going to survive another world war? Germany is rearming themselves again to a full military might. I guess third time's a charm for them. But then they want to rearm their entire military. Uh, you know, and with a lot of the worries within our society, uh, people are worried, what's going to happen next? But we as believers, to that, we ought to view it as waste. What's happening in the world, all that, yes, all the struggles that we face, all of these will not matter because we have eternal life. What a blessing, eternal life. What a uh, blessing it is to have the truth within our life. That we know that all of the sufferings, all the so uh, soils and the tears that are, we are facing today, all of that will be wiped away. Priorities that were a waste. Priorities that were wrong. He not only addresses them their priorities, but then thirdly here, I want to notice here, he addresses them to rebuild. He first talks about their excuse. You say that you don't have time. He addresses their priorities. You don't have time because you're building your own home. You're too busy building your own home when I have commanded you to build my house. Everything that you do right now in this world is a waste. Priorities here in this world will be a waste. They're wrong and they're a waste. And then he addresses them to rebuild. He addresses the people to rebuild. Notice here, first of all, the command to rebuild. The command to rebuild. Haggai chapter 7, oh, verse 1, it says, it's in verse 7, it says, Thus say the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Put your heart on the road. Put, set your heart on this road. And he got, and he has a very practical instruction now at this point when he says it. He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. The house of God was seized because of several external factors here under the Persian Empire here, under, in Jerusalem here. And he was saying to the people, go to the mountain, bring wood, build the house. Rebuild the house. And I'm, th I'm so thankful today that God provides an opportunity to correct ourselves. When we have the wrong priorities within my life, I know many times within my life if I were to prioritize the wrong things, God would at least give me an opportunity to correct it and focus on Him first. I think about several ways within my life, even this past week. Even this past week, I had to prepare several messages throughout because we had many events. And, uh, you know, I, there were distractions that were coming in many different ways. But I'm amazed how many times that if I were to, if I, I just said, you know what, these things need to be done first because this is the priority. God's Word is a priority. It's amazing how God has made ways to allow that opportunity, priorities to come into importance within our life. And likewise, within our life, we need to make sure that we are following what God has commanded us to do. It's not easy. It's not easy. And certainly there are so many distractions, so many things, so many things that can even pop up after the service too. Never know. But God has commanded them here to go up to the mountain, bring wood, build the house. Jesus was asked by the Pharisees a simple question, Master, which is the greatest commandment? Which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Even within the first four commandments of the ten, we're commanded in many ways to keep God first. To have no other idols, to not take the name of God in vain, but to keep God first and God only Himself. Even in Ephesus, even when Paul was writing to the Ephesus church, he says, See that he walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 
And he goes on to say, be filled with the Spirit. And he's saying, redeem the time because make most of your opportunities because this is an evil day. An evil day will be approaching one day. Redeem the time. Make the most of your opportunities and be filled with the Spirit. George Mueller said this, the first great and primary business that we ought to always attend, that I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not commanded here today to build a temple. We're not right now. But we're commanded to love God first. We're commanded to love others next. The first and second greatest commandment. We're commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're commanded to walk circumspectly. We're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And certainly other factors will come. Other distractions will come. We may be caught up with other businesses. We may be a little bit tired in the morning to focus on the Word of God in prayer and all these things. But God has commanded us to put God first within our life. To love God first. To place Him as our number one priority. The command to rebuild. But then secondly, I want to notice here, the cause to rebuild. The cause to rebuild. He says, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house. He gives him a command to rebuild. But then notice why. Notice the reason. The Lord speaks to Haggai and says this, I will take pleasure in it. I will be glorified, saith the Lord. And the first reason and the first cause is to please the Lord. And the reason why we prioritize God is because it pleases the Lord. When the people would start to rebuild the temple, it pleases, gives the Lord pleasing in his life. I want us to notice here, it's just really, it is not for us to be glorified. It is not for us to feel satisfied. It is not for us to receive the blessings. These are results that will come if we have the right priorities. But the reason why the first main cause that we have the right priorities within our life is to please the Lord. It's to love God. It's to give God the glory. Everything that we do within our personal lives must be to please the Lord. Everything that we do as a church must be to glorify God. It is not man's ambition, man's intention, man's personal desires that ought to be first. It is what God wants. It is what God desires. And everything that we do, we must prioritize giving God everything that He truly deserves, giving Him all the glory and honor. Obeying what God has commanded us to do because it pleases Him. It's not for our self-satisfaction, but it is to please the Lord. Paul addresses the issue of eating sacrificed meat to idols. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, whatsoever ye do, do all to the what? Glory of God. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church, even as I please all men in all things, and seek, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be, what? Saved. And he's saying, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Now you're wondering, why is Paul addressing specifically eat or drinking here? Well, I want to notice here, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. Remember, the Corinthian church had a lot of problems. They had a lot of divisions. They had a lot of strikes. And the issue here now came to a point, it was about meat that was sold in a market. So the current area, meat market there, they had meat being sold. But the problem is the meat here that was sold was also sacrificed unto idols. And he begins by saying to the Corinthian church, look, everything's permissible. Everything is lawful. Just because it is meat doesn't mean that meat itself is bad. It doesn't mean that at all. It does not mean that it brings great benefits for, uh, but, but just because everything is allowed, just because everything is lawful, doesn't mean that it benefits you doing them. Just because something, just because this meat that you want to buy to eat up, just because there's nothing wrong with that, doesn't mean that it's the best option or the best uh, beneficial choice that you can make. What's sold at the meat market was often sold as meat offered unto idols. If it doesn't bother you specifically, and you don't believe it, then there's nothing wrong with it. But if any man says unto you that the meat is offered unto sacrifice, 
as a sacrifice unto idols, don't eat it considering that person who asked. Consider that person who asked for their conscious state. And many times we use this passage here about the stumbling block. And then he summarizes here after explaining that, because the stumbling block is not the, not the primary focus of this message, but the focus of this here, he says, whatever you drink, now you get the context here. He's talking about meat here. Whatever you drink, eat, drink, whether it's permissive, whether you think personally it's not right or it is right, whatever you drink or eat, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Do everything for the glory of God. That the Gentile or the Church of God or the Jews, that I'm not doing whatever I want to do within my life, but I'm seeking it down to give glory to God, but that others may be saved. And the reason why he's addressing here the offering of meat to the idols is really here, look, you personally may not view it as a conscious problem, but to somebody that asks you, they may. So whatever you do, whatever choice that you make, make sure that ultimately that you give glory to God first. And that ultimately that you want to see God glorified through all the things that you do. Not your personal desire, not your personal ambitions, and so on. And likewise, within our life, it's not exact, or within this text, it's not exactly the same reference as Haggai was mentioning. But building a home is not necessarily bad. Building a house is not necessarily bad. But ultimately, everything that we ought to do, everything that we prioritize must be for the glory of God. Everything that we do within our life must be to please God. And ladies and gentlemen, I pray that all the priorities, that we wouldn't prioritize God first just for our sake, but we would prioritize God first and everything God has commanded us to do to give glory to God, to please God, to please Him. And so the first reason is to please the Lord. But the second reason is to see God's glory. Not only does the Lord say, I will take pleasure in it. He also says, I will be glorified, saith the Lord. And the people of God certainly responded even with fear. They heard this message. God told them, rebuild. And what did the people do? They did start to rebuild. They started to rebuild this temple. Haggai chapter 1 verse 12, it says, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and the Joshua, the son, uh, Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the high priest, when all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them, and God and the people did fear before the Lord. We even see this recorded in the book of Ezra in chapter 5. And the prophets, Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and in Jerusalem, in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, and with them were the prophets of God helping them. God was with the people of Israel once more because they had obeyed Him. In verse 13 it says, Then spake Haggai, the Lord messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you. I'm with you. You have obeyed, you have reprioritized everything. You, you were once not prioritizing the right things, but now you come to the point, you're rebuilding the temple, you're obeying me. And He says to the people, I am with you. I'm with you. I'm pleased with you. I see what you're doing. I see and I'm glorified because of that. And you as a result can receive the blessings. You as a result can receive God's glory and experience God's glory within our personal life. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Remember that verse we talked about worry. Seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What you're worrying about right now, seek the kingdom of God first. And after you do that, everything will be added unto you. God will provide. God will be with you if you prioritize me first. If you seek me first within your life. And when we have the right priorities, we don't have the right priorities for ourselves. We don't have the right priorities. Make, make it clear here. We don't have the right priorities just to receive the blessings. We have the right priorities to give God the glory. And when we give God the glory first, then we will see the blessings that come as a fruit beyond that. 
When we put God first within our life, within our day, within our week, within our giving, within our faithfulness to church, within our personal life, within soul winning, within every aspect within our life, we will not only please God, but we will see the blessings of God as well. And God wants to be with you. God wants to be with you as you go out to Anaki. God wants to be with you as you go out preaching the word. God wants to be with you with your struggles that you're going through and the trials that you're going through and the joy that you have with your family. But we need to first prioritize God first within our life. God has commanded us to love Him. God has commanded us to seek His kingdom. God has commanded us to put Him first. Our God is such a gracious and merciful God. Our God wants what's best for us. We're made in His image. He wants us to enjoy. He wants us to enjoy the blessings within. He wants us to still to live a joyful life. But He's giving simple instructions. Put me first. Put me first. I will be pleased. You will see the blessings. I am with you. And so this morning, in summary, the people here, they had to rebuild the temple of God. They used an excuse not to rebuild. It was a bad excuse. God points out their flaw in their excuse. It was the wrong priorities. The people of God were commanded to follow the right priorities. And they did, and God was glorified. God was with them. What are our priorities? God has given us command to love God first. God has given us a responsibility. God has given us even directness within the Word of God. Are we seeking to follow through with God, what God has commanded us to do first or our personal desires? Oh my friend, I just want to ask you this morning, what is our priorities? The distractions that get thrown into our life, it will come. And it's certainly distracting in many ways. But let us put God first. Because God wants to be there with us. God wants to be glorified. And we must first prioritize Him. And all the blessings will come within our mind. Put God first every morning. Put God first every, day, every week. Put God first in every aspect within our life. And when we do that, God will be glorified, and we will see the glory of God revealed in many different ways. The blessings of God revealed in many ways. Haggai addressed this issue with them. You guys are not having the right priorities. Rebuild, and they did. It pleased the Lord, God was glorified, and God said to them, I am with you.